This time we have a special appearance of media writer Stefan Eike. So this is Unset and you are welcome to Sound Files. I'm Stefan Eike. I am a writer. Although that always sounds very arrogant, so I like to say I write. I used to compose, um, sort of lost passion about that a couple of years ago. So now I concentrate on writing. And I used to be editor-in-chief of a film music magazine called Cinema Musica. And I also run a CD label called Caldera Records, which specializes in releasing the best possible soundtracks and the best possible quality. They also teach. I give classes and lectures in Hamburg, which is where I am now. I've given classes in the Netherlands and in Africa and um, any places who want to have me. In my position as editor-in-chief of Film Music magazine, which I used to do until 2016, I wrote reviews on film music, I wrote articles on film music, I did interviews with lots of composers, and now I write books. I've just published a book on film music, which is called The Struggle Behind the Soundtrack. It was published by McFarland, which is a publishing company in the US. And I'm working on the second book. What I wanted to do is just to sort of cleanse myself after working for a film music magazine for about eight or nine years. I wanted to find some sort of closure to say, okay, I've now finally written everything about film music I ever wanted to write, and that's it. And then, you know, go off to new adventures and write about other stuff, because there's so much to write about and so many topics and subjects that interest me. So that's why I wanted to write about film music and the challenges that composers face, because composers who I stayed in touch with and who I had dinner with or lunches with always complained about their job. And I thought, well, why, why do they actually complain? Do they have good reasons to complain? So I said it would be interesting just personally for me to find out what's behind that and to, to um, complete that puzzle to get a larger picture of why they are complaining and what their problems actually are. So I started out researching. I obviously read a lot of books. We have a beautiful library in, in, in London, which is where I live. It's the Rubin Library, which is part of the BFI, and they have every, every book on film ever written. So I spent lots of time there, read books on film music and on film. I then interviewed about 40 composers and sound designers. Working in film, I spoke with Alan Silvestri, Lorne Balf, Klaus Bartelt, Rachel Portman, um, and George Fenton, all these great composers. Spoke with Walter Murch and Randy Thomas, sound designers, and finally managed to get enough material to compile the book. And of course, the book always writes itself. You don't decide what you're going to write. It's always the, the process that develops. And I didn't know what to expect when I started writing, and it turned out to be quite an adventure and very difficult to write, because you write about lots of different subjects, and of course they're all interconnected, which is something I hadn't foreseen when I started writing. So it was, it was tough to, to write, but I'm glad I did it. My aim was to write the book for everybody who's interested in film music. That's hopefully a very large group of people, but that includes composers who are already established in the field who can empathize with the problems that composers face, students who want to get into the industry who should be pre prepared for the struggles they might face at some point or another, as well as film music fans who are not necessarily interested in composing, but who are interested in the composers I interviewed and their work and what they have to say about their own work and how they go about composing for film. So that means it's not an academic book with lots of fancy words and difficult language because that's pretty boring. It's not the kind of book I would want to read. So I hope that you know everybody can take something away from it, as I said, students as well as composers 
as well as film music fans. I did condense quite heavily. I mean, I, as I said, I interviewed 40 composers and of course I took brief excerpts from these interviews and put them in the text. So it's not a book of interviews, but the interviews are part of the text. And composers were, to, much to my surprise, really open to, to talk about ghostwriting, for example, and how the time pressure, especially in Hollywood, forces composers to seek help in composing, orchestrating, arranging. And, you know, they were very honest about talking about temp tracks, for example, about digital editing and how that is difficult for them, how the industry has changed technologically over the past couple of decades, um, as well as how Hans, Hans Zimmer has influenced the, the industry with his um, factory, and I don't mean to be judgmental, it's just the, the way it is. His group of people that help him create a film score according to the needs of producers and directors. And all these subjects. So I was surprised by how open and honest they were. I hope my book doesn't discourage anybody because I lay out the challenges that at one point or another you might face as a composer in the industry. And somebody who wants to embark on a career in film music, I think should be aware of the pitfalls that he or she is going to face at some point. So I think, I hope it's very valuable to be aware of these issues and to learn as much about them as possible. So yes, I encourage every student or anybody who's interested in becoming a film composer to obviously read my book um, and as well as, as already established composers who might not feel alone anymore with their struggles, who realize, oh, there are lots of other composers who have similar problems as I do. Composers obviously need to have their secret recipes and tools on how to deal with certain issues because otherwise the stress is just going to wear you down. So they know how to deal with these issues. They've been in the business for, in the case of Alan Silvestri, for nearly 40 years. So they are the perfect people to give you advice. And they you know, talk about how they manage to navigate in this shark tank where you have to you know, talk to producers and directors, work for both, and you have to face a multitude of opinions and you have to satisfy all parties. Well, how do you do that? And much my gratitude, all these composers explain to me how they do that and how it's possible to you know, get through a day of meetings and how to deliver a score that many people are satisfied with, as many people as possible. Marco Beltrami told a very interesting story. Marco Beltrami is a composer working in the US who's worked for, he recently did the music for A Quiet Place. And he said he once worked on a project where the producer and director really couldn't agree on an approach for the music. And the producer was very happy with the score that Marco had written for the project whereas the director really wasn't happy at all. So how do you deal with that situation? Because at the end of the day, you are paid by the producer, whereas it's, it's you know, to a large extent the director's creative vision that you're helping to fuel and that you're working on. So Marco said he just wrote the score twice. He wrote one version of a whole score, just like 90 minutes of music and delivered it to the producer, who loved it, director hated it. So he wrote an entirely new score for the director. And he then said, well, let them figure it out. Let them argue about which cues they want to pick and choose. That's not my battle. And Alan Silvestri told a very similar story. They said it's much easier to write the same score twice and to write, therefore, a piece twice than it is writing a piece 14 times, which is what can happen if you try to satisfy both the director and the producer at the same time. So these are little nuggets and uh, judgment calls, as John Ottman calls them. You have to make these judgment calls, and how you do that, that is really colorfully explained by the people I spoke to. If it works for Alan Silvestri and Marco Beltrami, I think, I think you're good to go.
It is just a text. There are no written examples, no written scores, for example, as in there. But of course, there's an index, and you know everything is explained in brackets, and there are footnotes. And uh, I, th I didn't feel I needed any more than that because the text itself and the interviews that I did with the composers are self-explanatory. As I said, I originally only wrote the book for myself because I wanted to get it out of my head. And if I can make other people happy with it, that's you know, the icing on the cake and that's a wonderful bonus. So I hope everybody will enjoy what I've written. I first heard and saw David Lindley live on German television in 1982. Immediately I was hooked. Man, he played some mean slide guitar. Of course, I got his latest album, A Ryo X, right away. It had all the hits. Mercury Blues, Bye Bye Love, Quarter of a Man and all the other songs presented in his very unique style, kind of like reggae, but not really. Actually, there's not that much guitar on El Rio X, organ all over, and also some accordion. Quite unusual instrumentation. So there you have it.